All right. So I prepared more of um, a video presentation for today, and I'll narrate as I uh, as I go through it. So what I'm going to talk about is smart meters. They're the power meters. They're on the side of your house, the side of a building, usually the round thing. They used to have little spinning dials on them. Now they're all electronic, and they transmit their data back wirelessly. Um, and so what you see here is a drive from my house in North Texas down to Dallas and back up. And these are all the smart meters. Sorry. These are all the smart meters that I received along the way. And so those red dots are all a different meter that I received with a USRP B200, my laptop, and an antenna stuck on top of the car. And what you see there, that D003 is the, the meter ID, and the 1767 is the number of days it's been running. Basically, it's uptime that they broadcast. And so you can see all this. And this became interesting to me as I live in Texas. And in February, there was a big freeze, and we all lost power for like a week. Um, and so they, this information, they were saying, was super secure, and they didn't want to tell anybody about the outage information, all this stuff. And, and I thought, well, I've been kind of receiving this stuff in the clear for quite a while now. Um, and that seemed interesting to me. So, so this is basically kind of like a, a culmination of a last probably couple of years of, of research, I would say, that I've been doing on this. So this is, uh, this is me. There was a DEF CON talk I just gave. Um, I would say this isn't my background at all. I do this strictly for fun as a hobby. Um, GNU Radio Electronics Reverse Engineering. Um, and I mentioned the names. That's a smart meter right there. Um, Landis and Gear, who makes that smart meter, and Encore, who is the power provider in my area. Uh, I don't do that to name and shame in any way. It's just this talk is very specific to that meter and that that power provider, and so I don't want it to kind of be viewed as a, a general talk about all meters or all providers. Um, and so you see kind of a bit of my lab in the background. So I don't know if anyone knows who this guy is, um, Travis Goodspeed. So he gave a good talk um, a few years back called In Praise of Junk Hacking. And the premise of that talk was that you shouldn't do what I'm doing because it attracts a lot of undue attention um, from people with billion dollar wallets. And instead, you should reverse engineer all the stuff that's inside the smart meter, but that's inside other kind of stuff that doesn't really matter at all, like the, the CC1020 transceiver chip or the, micro, you know, the microcontroller. And so find something else that contains that device and reverse engineer it there. And then that way, you know, everyone kind of knows there's an issue with it, but you aren't attacking these kinds of systems. Um, and so when I watched at the time, it made great sense. And so I kind of kept my research quiet, but the, the challenge I found is that there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that happen, like these kinds of attacks. And, and I think, you know, as this equipment stays out in the field longer and longer, it just becomes more vulnerable to things. So I thought, why not just talk about kind of the elephant in the room, these devices and, and what's contained in them and, and how well they work and how secure really they are over time. So luckily, they put together a great video that'll kind of give an overview of this um, the system, it's all, all voiceover, their marketing video. Their voiceover is a little, a little cheesy. Um, and so this shows a, a neighborhood. And inside the neighborhood, they'll show a, a meter. And so they make devices kind of for gas meters and power meters and all these others. And so what they did initially inside is they, they have a few different models. Some of them have a separate transceiver board. Some of them, the transceiver board and the metering's all on one. But they'll report back the metering wirelessly. And so it's all over a mesh network. So when the meters transmit, they relay their neighbor's data as well, and they bounce it back across this, um, across this network, as you'll see, up to a device that if you look around, if this is in your city, it'll be up on a, a pole somewhere, usually a power pole, that's called a router or a collector. And that device aggregates all that data from the meters and it sends it back to the power company. Either it relays it at a higher bit rate, kind of in the same spectrum to this thing you'll see here called a collector, or sometimes there's a cellular modem that's inside that, um, that router that's on a pole where it's kind of like a combined router collector. And this is um, just one I found near me driving by a, a substation that I show there. And then it goes ultimately back to some kind of a command center, I guess, in the power company. Now, when I first started looking at this, 
Um, I found this paper on the IEEE. Obviously, a lot of this information is hard to come by. It's not like they're publishing the specs anywhere. Um, and it's not open standards as far as I can determine. And so this RF mesh systems for smart metering was written by a couple of people at Landis and Gear. And funny enough, the test system that was deployed was based in Dallas. So there's a bunch of maps in there of stuff that, that show meters in Dallas. And this part was the most interesting to me. They had what they employed, a, they called a geographical routing protocol. And so it used the, the latitude and longitude of the location to route messages across the network. And so I thought, you know, what, what is that? Like, is it GPS aware or, or how does that work? And, and I was thinking myself, like, could you craft a message that would write across this network? So, so I wondered, how could I get some gear to play with this? And, you know, you could go take one off a house somewhere, but it'd be tough to talk about it publicly. But turns out eBay um, has everything you would ever need, and it's priced pretty, uh, pretty well. And I'm fairly certain that on a long enough timeline, everything that's produced, no matter how secure, ends up on eBay. So this is, um, this is, I guess, inside my lab, you know, kind of in quotes at home. And you'll see I have, I have a lot of this gear. I've been buying it over kind of a, a long period of time, so I didn't all pick it up in a day. And so you see a bunch of meter circuit boards there, the round ones. There's some of these modems that are the the square devices. I have some commercial meters and, and uh, residential meters from whoever's selling them on eBay for whatever purpose they sell them on eBay. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, and then GNU radio that's pretty much running constantly. Um, capturing, we'll talk more about this um, flow graph and what this is a little later, but I, I capture kind of large amounts of data from the area around me to try to understand anything that's, that's happening and, and try to discern something out of this data. And so that white thing you see on the bottom left, there's one of those collectors that was on a pole. I didn't take it off the pole, um, but somebody, it came, it came somewhere from a pole and it was on eBay. And then that's a Faraday cage that I use um, to isolate some of the signals when I'm doing testing. Um, and, you know, at first when I, was, when I was doing tests, I wasn't sure what was going on. So I wanted to isolate everything. So I started kind of by reverse engineering the, the circuit boards. And so just, you know, with a meter toning it out, um, that's the M16C processor. That one is, the other one was a Turidian microcontroller used to do the metering. And this is the, um, the CC1020. That's the transceiver chip made by TI. And one of the other in interesting things to me about this was inside each one of these units is a massive relay that can switch 240 volts, 200 amps, 10,000 times, according to their data sheet. I haven't tested it. Um, but what you'll see here, it's got a little motor and you can send a signal to it. There's an optical port on the front of the meters that will allow you to control this. Um, and there's, they also say it can be trolled over the, the mesh network. So basically you can call up to have power turned on. They send a signal and a few seconds later, the power turns on and vice versa. I imagine if you don't pay your bill. And so that's it. You see there opening and, and closing as I kind of power the motor. And so that's part of a kind of a big part of the analysis, you know, how secure are those messages? How secure is that, that system? And, and how do you craft a message to cause that to happen wirelessly? So, so along that pursuit, I, I used an FPGA and some glitching to dump the, the firmware out of the microcontroller. And so this is it you see in binary ninja right now, where I'm trying to step through the assembly and, and figure out what all this, um, what all this stuff is. This is actually the bootloader and it's only 4k so it's an easier thing to kind of start with because you know, like i say this isn't my full-time job and the other thing's 384k of assembly and so it's quite a bit to try to step through and, and figure out but even with the bootloader you can see it's a bit of uh it's a bit of information to try to to dive through but a, a fun weekend project and so this everyone here is familiar with this is showing the spectrum it's 902 to 928 megahertz so it's about 26 megahertz of bandwidth plus a little over the edges that I'm trying to grab and look at this. They frequency hop within there at about 240 channels. They're 100 kilohertz spaced um, and about 9,600 baud. So when I first started, I wasn't a GNU radio expert. I started with this. If anyone's familiar with this device from Great Scott Gadgets, it's basically a CC1020 with a USB port that you can plug into a computer and I could listen to a single channel of data. So I'd set a frequency somewhere and I just listened to what came in. And since all the meters are supposed to hop uh, evenly across this, 
I'd hear a decent amount of data and I was, I could set a sync word and I'd be very sure that the data coming across was pretty good. At first I was using this clock recovery MM block in GNU radio and, and had just a shoddy experience trying to get data and be sure the data was correct. And so, you know, ultimately though, I, I was like, GNU radio is, you know, it's like the pinnacle of, of doing something like this. And so I can't stick with this little single channel device. I got to figure it out. And so, I did actually get that clock recovery thing to start to work. And the, the key piece that allowed me to do this was I figured out how they do the CRC calculation on the data they send across. And so I was actually able to verify if the data was correct or not and discard the packets that weren't correct. So what this is, is basically one megahertz worth of stream coming in to a polyphase channelizer that I split across to 10 channels. And then, you know, and I'm, there's probably a better way. This was just the way that I figured out at the time, right? Um, then I feed across to what you can see is 10 of the exact same things, and I dump it to a file that that appends the data. And so that kind of worked. I was pretty happy with it. It was the first time I ever received more than one channel of data. Um, and so I thought, well, all I have to do is do that 240 times, and then, you know, bam. So, um So I basically turned this into a hierarchy um, block and built a hell of an AMD computer with a GPU and all this stuff. And, um, and, and basically, uh, am I going? Yeah, I basically did that. And so I was super pumped because 240 channels of data is coming through, the machine's redlining, right? It's just maxed out everything you can flow through. I probably couldn't have done any other calculations on this thing, but it is dumping all this stuff to a file. Um, and so, you know, like I did a victory dance and then realized like, I, I don't know what the heck to do with it and stuff's kind of landing all over the place and it's not really coherent. Um, so who, who knows who this guy is? So this is Jacob Gilbert. He gave a talk a couple years ago, um, here, I guess I was sitting in my house in December, kind of, uh, stressed and, and disappointed that I thought I figured it out and I didn't. And I came across this, I'll refer to him from here on out as the savior, because nothing would have happened uh, until, until I found this talk from him. And so what he talks about is this frequency hopping spread spectrum toolkit that Sandia had released that, that basically is the much smarter way of doing what I was trying to do. So it grabs all of this data, it packetizes it into PDUs that then I can just analyze these small packets of data that are already ready to go for me. And I don't have to deal with trying to handle all the other stuff. And so this is that GNU radio flow graph um, where he has the burst tagger and he turns those bursts into a PDU, um, sends it across uh, and does the quadrature demodulation and all that. His talk is a much, you know, it's an hour long version of, of this that's much better at explaining all of what's awesome about that block. Um, but when it comes down to the bottom here, what it goes into is uh, the ability to specify a sync word which will then narrow down all these different things that it's receiving to just what I want to receive. Um, and it's doing FSK demodulation of, uh, of these signals that are coming across. And so down here is where it specifies the, the sync word. I'll put in the sync word that is for um, the smart meters that are used by Landis Aguirre. This is this. At first, when I started, I just did kind of the 1010 at the front. But later on, I, I took a closer look at it. And so they send 52 bits of just the the one zero for sync but then they have a header and so i was matching on the header that's on the bottom left um which is this zero zero ff two a and you'll notice it has start and stop bits like uh, kind of the old rs232 uh, protocol that's sent across and what i noticed when i went back and and looked at some stuff again is that they they did a couple cool things so there's they they segregate out systems by using a crc so different power providers could be right next to each other and they'll each have their own unique, uh, they call it a network ID. It's a CRC that the calculation that's done so that one power provider doesn't see the other power provider's data. But then I think they're trying to advance their system. And so they have this version one to version four hardware. I have versions two, three, and four various devices and they all use that sync word on the bottom left. Now on the bottom right, I got a hold of a newer device, a version five, and I noticed I wasn't seeing any of the packets. So I went back all the way to the PDU and I looked at it. And what I realized is they stuck an extra one, one in there and they violated the, um, the start and stop bit so that any of the older generation, I think just discards it. 
but it allows the newer generation to have backwards compatibility. So they kind of have these two splits. They can do it with the sync word, and they can also split with the CRC calculation. So, and I also realized actually just probably like a few days ago that I can specify multiple sync words in this, um, in this uh, PDU align block, which is pretty cool. So I fed both of those in there now. Now we get to the block that I actually wrote. Um, this is the, um, it's in a, block, uh, a thing called GR Smart Meters. I call it Gridstream. And so there's a few things that, that I specify in there that I let you specify. There's a CRC value that's used to pick which network you want to listen to. There's a thing to enable or disable it because when you're first listening to a network, you don't know what the CRC is. So you need to capture some packets to figure out what it is. And I'll show that. And then I let you, you know, select a meter ID. Like if I just want to listen to my own meter. Um, there's a couple different packet types that I'll show here in a minute, um, and then the packet length, because the, the length, there's various packets that you might want to filter on. And so this 5FD6 is the CRC for Encore, where I am, and I list that on the, the GitHub page. So this one, so there's a couple couple main packets. This is the one that you see when I visualized all the GPS data. It's called a 5.5 packet. It's basically broadcast um, once a minute or, or faster. And inside here, where it says WAN address over here, um, that's actually the GPS address encoded in. And I have a separate YouTube video of how I figured out what all that encoding is and, and all that. And then there's their uptime they broadcast in the meter ID and some other information that I'm kind of slowly uh, figuring out what it is. And so that's just a broadcast packet. I think it's saying I'm here and, and here's where I'm located. And then there's also these packets like this one. Um, there's a, a various different links of them that are called a D5 packet. And these are basically like a routed packet. So there's a destination meter, a source meter. There's some information that it's asking it to relay across the network. And then some common information that I kind of put on the the right hand side and so some of that I I know what it is and and other parts I'm just kind of slowly uh, slowly figuring it out by capturing data and analyzing it when various events occur like a it's a good event um, when a power outage occurs then you know you can capture and see what's different there and so right here what I'm specifying is I want to look just at the five five packets and just at the ones that are of length 23, which are those GPS kind of uh, filtered packets. And I use this socket PDU to send it to a TCP stream as well. And then I have a Python uh, program that I wrote that is what actually decodes it and outputs the, the GPS coordinates and the, the timestamp kind of data. And so that's what we'll see here when it runs. On this flow graph, I was using a, a hack RF I had at the time um, to test it out. And so you see the packets showing up in the, the bottom left there um, when I crank up the gain a little bit. And so that's it, picking them up, uh, decoding them. I think right now I don't have the CRC turned on. And so it was part of a demo video where I was showing somebody how to actually set this up and, and capture the data. And so it does, um, it does a much better job than that clock recovery block that I had been using before. This is actually really, uh, really reliable for grabbing data. And it became even more reliable recently when I kind of shrunk down my sync word and wasn't so, um, wasn't trying to make it conform to the full thing, but just uh, shrunk it down a bit. So when you get this data here, what I'll do is I'll come over here to this page and I show at the bottom, there's a, a tool called RevEng, and it basically is for reverse engineering checksums. So if you don't know the checksum of something, you can feed the data in there along with the CRC, and it'll try every known checksum with every known value and spit out what that is, um, which is super, super valuable if you're working on stuff like this. And so the beginning part of the packet all the way up to the length, you don't really need to use. It's everything after that all the way down to the checksum at the end, and you copy and paste. If you give it four values that are good, it will spit out um, what the calculation is. So you don't have to give it a lot of data. It does have to be good though. So you do, sometimes you have, it's kind of trial and error to figure out which packets were good and which ones weren't. And so that's it here. All you really have to specify is the width. So I tell it 16 bits is the CRC and a dash S to search. And then you just give it whatever data you want and it will output the result from that. 
And so I'll feed in four of the packets right here and tell it to do a search. And, and that's that 16 bits for the width. And so it knows then that the four, the, the two bytes that are on the end of each one of these packets, it should consider the, the CRC that it's going to try to figure out. And I mean, it runs super fast. This isn't a supercomputer that this thing's running on. It's just a regular uh, little laptop and it outputs a result almost immediately. Um, especially for 16-bit stuff. And so it tells you that the, the poly is 1021, which is pretty standard for this stuff, and it tells you the initialization value is, is 5FD6. Now, the network ID that they use is actually different when you look at their documentation. It's actually like the CRC of that value gives you the network ID, um, but for this block that I wrote, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't matter. And so then I'll, I'll go back here, I'll, I'll turn this back to true so that we're only going to feed out packets that we're actually sure are the correct packet. And I'll start up this Python application, which is going to decode it and spit out the GPS coordinates. So once I, just from a pure reverse engineering standpoint, once I figured this out and was able to get packets that I knew were good, then it really helped kind of further things as well because I knew I wasn't chasing weird bit errors that I thought maybe was something special that, that I should be looking at. And so this just connects to that, um, that output from the flow graph and starts dumping this data. And so what you'll see is it dumps the meter ID, then the uptime in seconds, the uptime in days, the latitude, longitude, and then just the current timestamp so that if I wanted to plot this visually as, as I was driving down the road or something like that, I could kind of show the meters pop up as it reads them. And so I take this to um, basically a website that'll do kind of a CSV to KML converter. And so I can feed that then into Google Earth to do the visualization. I was trying to get with somebody to write me a real time uh, deal to pop it up like as we kind of war drive Dallas to pop up all the meters in the area and so that's kind of still a, a work in progress but it does support the RTL SDR or anything else so someone with just some super cheap hardware could go out there and capture the data and so so ultimately that's what culminated in in this view that you see here of um, of me driving down the road I wasn't cruising slowly or anything I mean that's what you pick up going freeway speed 70 miles an hour down the freeway and back and so all everything you've seen so far is just passive listening. But what I realized is that in order to really do some serious testing, I need to transmit back. But then, you know, I can't transmit back on the network that's around me. So what I've been working on most recently is uh, basically trying to construct my own smart meter network with all the stuff that I've got and what I understand about it so far. So what you see on the screen here is actually the collector application that was running inside of that white device there. It turns out that thing runs Windows 7. Uh, the whole collector is in a folder and it runs standalone. It's written in .NET. And so I've been teaching myself to reverse engineer .NET. And so this is me taking this thing apart. I have a separate video that shows kind of the teardown of this um, and discovering all these devices. But someone, I, I was tweeting something and someone responded and said, hey, have you looked inside that thing? Like there's an SSD in there. And it'd been sitting on my floor for like eight months. I hadn't looked at it other than to unplug the big battery to prevent it from trying to talk back wherever it was trying to call. Um, and so I, I, you know, I did this teardown video. I started taking it apart and I, you know, and that's a, so when the power goes out, these things can relay the messages back. So like when power goes out on your house, it transmit that message back even once power goes out. So everything has enough time to do that. And so this is one of the modem boards. That's the latest one, that version five, like what you see inside these other ones that I have. And then when I pull off this metal plate, that's when I saw this Windows computer, and that was pretty much my face when it, when I saw that it had an SSD. And I, I didn't even know it was running Windows at the time or anything. I mean, it was just kind of jackpot after jackpot as I, as I took that apart. Um, and so I tried initially to run that image itself in a virtual machine and get it to run. And it didn't want to run in a virtual machine. And I thought, well, what if I just take the whole folder onto a different Windows computer and run it? And sure enough, it ran just fine. Um, and it would, it would start right up. I, I segregated out the network just so it wouldn't try to phone home and do whatever it's, it's trying to do, which turns out it, it doesn't really do that. And you can also load up D and spy, which basically lets you decompile .NET. And I mean, if assembly, like if that processor was able to do this, who knows what I could do on this system right now. But with .NET, it, 
you know, literally everything comes out. It's not obfuscated in any way. You see all the, the function names, everything about this thing is, is right there. And you can just click run and run the whole thing in debug and set breakpoints and I mean the full kind of jackpot of reverse engineering. And so when I ran it, I was trying to figure out, I plugged in, um, I plugged in one of my modems with a USB to serial converter into that computer and it started talking to it. And so I, you know, I had the whole thing kind of set up in that Faraday cage and, and everything dialed down trying to figure out, you know, what's it going to do. And, and I, I realized kind of quickly that I needed to, to set some parameters in this application. So there was an INI file. And so I opened up that INI file and this is what I found. And I thought, well, I'm kind of pretty, I'm pretty accustomed to look at it, just raw hex. So it's like, I wonder what is what, um, but I couldn't make anything out of it. And so I thought, well, I'll just start looking around in the, the .NET application. And, and so I started trying to figure out how to explore in there. And, and what I noticed was that, oh, when it loads this INI file, it runs this decrypt block routine. And so it reads the file. And so I set a breakpoint there. And, and then sure enough, I could see all the variables in memory. And there was that INI file. And so I could see the values. But I tried to change it in memory. And it, it wasn't having any of that. Um, and the whole thing would just crash. So I thought, well, here's the encrypt block portion of that. I thought, well, what if I just take it? You see right at the top, there's contents and then there's array. And so it takes contents, it encrypts it into array and it writes array. And it's like, well, what if I just delete array and write contents instead? And so sure enough, the INI file shot out. So then I just changed the decrypt routine to not do any decrypting, just to load the file. And now I can set all these different parameters in there and, and adjust it to, to try to drive which modem it talks to and how it um, configures the network. And so that's it running now. Uh, the most important thing there is it says timekeeper, like up at the very top at the right. So when I would turn on my own meters, they would transmit a bunch of stuff, but they wouldn't really do anything because they're not finding a network. And so I can't really have uh, any kind of, you know, the simulation isn't really real, right? Because it's not gonna do anything until it finds a network. And so when I set this up and got it running, it was talking to another meter. I set both of their network IDs the same because I figured out all these debug modes in the meters and had to set some pins low to enter those special modes and things like that. Um, and they started talking and I noticed the meter, it stopped transmitting the message it was kind of looking for a network and it's time synced to this thing and they started communicating. So now I kind of have the initial makings of my own smart meter network that I'll add some more devices onto. And so that's one of the packets from the meter itself that's in my house that it received and popped up. And that's how I knew, okay, these things are really talking. I'm also receiving the whole thing with GNU Radio at the same time, listening to try to basically say, what do I see here? What did I see in GNU Radio? And how does that stuff correlate? So I've been publishing a ton of videos on YouTube um, about this stuff. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure book. Like this is as far as I am in this thing. This is a website I have with some wiki links and things at the bottom where I publish all this information. Um, and I just reverse engineer and I kind of publish as I go. So, you know, I'm here, we're all here together. Um, there's nothing really further that I've figured out. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of publish this journey as I go and, and share it with everyone and whoever comments and gives feedback, then maybe that changes the, the direction of the journey I go and what I try to look at. That's the GitHub page with the, the smart meter block. Um, Jacob Gilbert helped a lot getting that to 3.9. Um, and this is uh, some contact information uh, about me if you're interested in following along with what I'm doing or, or uh, contributing. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions, I'll take them as well.